David and I are so pleased to be with you to, to round out this important day. And having David here at Wisdom 2.0, which is not his first Wisdom 2.0, feels exactly right to me. And I had three reasons why that was true, and now I have four. Um, there are probably more. <laughs> but one is that the work that you're doing at the Obama Foundation is fundamentally aligned with what so many of us do and why so many of us are here. It's really about cultivating capability in humans to create change together, to have an impact on the world. And that is so aligned that having you here feels right. And the way that you lead that organization is as an authentic, real, learning, growing human. <laughs> And you practice the very capabilities that you're teaching those young leaders that you're so invested in. And we saw that here today. And I just want to pause for a minute and thank you for the space that you created, uh, for the folks on stage here today talking about the Parkland experience, and for all of us who were able to go along this journey with these incredible people and, and with, with David's guidance, helping us understand a bit of their experience um, and leave with a sense of hope. And that was uh, extraordinary. And I think we, we saw your authenticity and, and the love that you bring the work that you do. So thank you for that. Yeah. Can we give David a, yeah. And so now the fourth reason why this is just so right <laughs> is that you have something in common with many people in this room. How many of you were first inspired around mindfulness by John Kabat-Zinn? So we all have this shared history, and uh, so your, your mindfulness practice really shows itself in, um, in the work that you do and the work that you lead. So thank you for being here. Thank you, it's a real pleasure this 10-year anniversary. Yeah. yeah. Um, Karen, you're too kind. Um, this experience um, today, but even yesterday, um, and then just being around the people in this room um, is deeply moving, and uh, so I'm ready to dig in a little bit. Let's do it. Good. Good. Well, we're going to come back to your mindfulness practice, but I want to start with the mission of the Obama Foundation. And, and when we've talked... You've used the language about the tearing apart of our society and the othering that is happening, and we've heard some of that this afternoon as well, the, the othering and how deeply concerned you and, and the others in the foundation are about that. And so you've built a mission that is around empowering people to change, and I'm, this word in your mission is very interesting to me, uh, to change their world. Yes. And I want you to talk a little bit about that mission and, and why the mission that you chose is about that empowerment versus about a particular agenda. So Karen, it was, um, and it's still surreal. Um, so October of 2016, I'm still in the White House. And my colleague says, David, the president wants to see you. And no matter how many times you've heard that, <laughs> <laughs> it's worse than the principal, huh? <laughs> it's worse than the principal. Mm -hmm. uh, although every lived experience was exponentially better than the principal. Okay. Uh, I had some rough principles. No offense to all of them watching at home. Um, on this day, I walk up, I go into the office, and the conversations were always um, very similar. So you walk into that room, and as the son of two Portuguese immigrants, to walk into the Oval Office and to see Barack Obama sitting at the Resolute desk mm -hmm. with a bust of Martin Luther King and just understanding the, the majesty of that, I never got used to it. <laughs> and we would say to each other as colleagues, the moment when you don't feel the responsibility and the awe is the day that you have to leave. Mm. Because you're doing a disservice to that president and more importantly, to the to people the that we serve. Mm -hmm. 
So on this day, he asked me how my girls were. I said, they're great. I asked him how his girls were. He said, they're fine. And then he got down to business. <laughs> it's like a dance. And he said, um, paraphrasing, but he said, David, uh, I want to build an institution whose sole focus is to identify the next generation of leaders. I want to build the largest global network of values-based change makers that has ever been assembled. Because at the end of the day, you can focus rightly on poverty, on justice, on gun violence, on climate, on any number of issues. But the truth is we know the solutions to most, if not all of them. But what inhibits us isn't the specific policy or the piece of legislation, it is a failure of leadership. And all Washington is, is frankly a reflection of the country. And I think what the president saw and what I saw in the metaphor that, that we use is um, our civic fabric is tearing. The default for people, and I saw this vividly, uh, where if someone identified as a Republican or someone identified as a Democrat, that was essentially the permission to stop listening. Even if when you took the time to say, we agree on these five things, we disagree on these two, let's begin to work on these. The identity was the most dominant the factor The identity there. defined mm -hmm. everything that flowed from it. Mm -hmm. And so imagine if, in a very purposeful and intentional way, like we saw those two young people on the stage today, mm -hmm. uh, Alea and, and Adam yeah. were extraordinary. <laughs> so, if we build this network of young people, imagine the exponential change that we can make around all of the issues that we care about, mm -hmm. but in, do it in doing it in a way that is uh, around bringing people together rather than tearing them yeah. apart. So that's why capacity is at the core of what we intend to do. Yeah. How so. many hours did it take you to say yes? Um, I, I tried to be coy. <laughs> I, you know, yeah, sitting back, and like, well, I've got to talk to Shauna. Shauna's my wife. And he looked at me knowingly as like, yeah, she's fine. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's just not fair. That's why he's the president, right? That's why. So yeah. it, it, was, it was fairly quick. Thank yeah. you for reminding me of that moment. <laughs> You're very welcome. OK, so you've got a mission designed around really getting at the core. Yeah. Um, getting underneath the surface of any particular issue or set of issues and rebuilding or building the capability at an individual level of change makers. Yeah. So you, when you and I first met, you were designing your curriculum around this change making. And I believe that you have identified a beautiful process, built a beautiful process for teaching um, budding change makers uh, how to create change. And I'd love for you to take the time to Good. walk us through the pieces of that. I'll do that. Um, and start at the very beginning because as yeah. it matters so much. So, um, and when you think about gun reform or gun violence, it's actually a perfect example of why this approach is important. You will never persuade someone to change their mind by telling them they're wrong. <laughs> try it. Oh, yeah? <laughs> should, we do, should we try this now? Right. <laughs> you will never persuade someone who believes something different or has a different identity by giving them your flawless logic, your 15-point plan reinforced by the best facts that you've determined. It doesn't work. So what we do is with um, all of the young people we convey, we put them on a journey. The journey begins with individual agency. You have power, you have voice. It is a necessary precondition because cynicism in the fraying of the civic fabric is actually driven by when people check out. I don't have voice, I don't have power, I cede it to someone else. Individual agency begins with that sense of me. I have a voice, I have power, which is why it was so important on the stage today with the Parkland to begin with their story. Mm -hmm. 
because there wasn't a person in this room or anyone watching that when Fred Gutenberg is talking about the moment that he heard about his daughter, I'm sitting there thinking about my two girls. You have to. And it puts people on this empathetic stage where you see another person. Once you get them there to me, however, the danger is that they stay in me. Mm -hmm. That the primacy of their independence means that they have all of the solutions and all of the answers. The transition to we mm -hmm. is essential. And so what we do as part of this first step is we do storytelling, we do narrative exchange. My favorite example, we did at an Obama summit two years ago. There was a young man from the south side of Chicago doing, sitting knee to knee with a young woman from Aleppo, Syria. And what they did was, and we learned this from a group called Narrative Four, I tell you my personal story, my story of why you tell me yours. I then stand up in front of the room and I tell Kieran's story in the first person. What does that require? That requires not just that I'm listening to you, but I am internalizing everything that you are saying and try to get underneath to truly understand you. And then to convey it in a way that does justice to you begins to take someone out of that sense of agency that I have to we. Mm -hmm. So individual agency is the necessary precondition, and it's the heart of citizenship in a pluralistic democracy. Voting is the minimum requirement. <laughs> Not rights, responsibilities. Which then moves us to the next piece of collective action. Mm -hmm. Collective action, then, what we do with young people is we sit them down over a 14-hour period to begin with. We devote three hours to the personal narrative. We make them practice it and understand it and be authentic with it, share it. Then we move to something we call issue mapping. Karen, what is that thing that you care so much about that you would pay to do it? And the young people will say, I care deeply about poverty. And we say, that's great, that's wonderful. Now, tell us what the seven root causes of poverty are. What? <laughs> Work through them. An hour and a half later, after they've done the seven or eight root causes of poverty or whatever they've chosen, we say, right, pick the first two that you think are the most predictive. What are the root causes of those? By now, heads are exploding. Like, why are you frustrating us? We want to go solve the problem. We want to go, because no issue is binary. Everything derives from systems. Everything is interrelated. Understand that dig into it. And here's the other byproduct. You and I can disagree on the first four root causes, but if we agree on root cause number five and six, my ability now to work across difference mm -hmm. flows from that. Step three, my personal favorite, given my past life in politics, power mapping. All right, you just told me what you cared about. Who makes the decisions? The mayor does, wonderful. When the mayor is sitting at her desk, trying to decide what to do, who does she turn to? Why does she turn to them? What are the political implications? What are the normative implications? What are the reputational implications? What are the legal? What are the regulatory? Map it, understand it. Because if you don't go deep into seeing where power comes from in the way people think about it, putting yourself in their shoes, you're limiting yourself. And then the final step is asset inventory, which is one of the most impactful, which is, all right, you're good at X, I'm good at Y, you're good at Z, you're good at all of this. And so what do you have at the end of this 14-hour session? You've got young people who now know how to not just be activists, but organizers. Mm -hmm. In the difference between the two, activism is a necessary precondition of change. It is energy, it's the protest, it's the march, it's galvanizing attention. Organizing is taking the message, the personal narrative, understanding the power structure, building the coalition around the asset inventory, around that thing that you care about the most. Perfect example of this. 
Two weeks ago, I went to, the Montgomery, to Montgomery, Alabama to the Peace and Justice Museum and Memorial. I am urging everyone in this room to take the time to go to Montgomery. When you reflect on what Dr. King did, Dr. King chose Selma for a reason. He knew that the sheriff there was the worst, most violent sheriff in the entire South. He knew that the chances of going to that community, bringing a spirit of nonviolence, he knew what the sheriff there would do. And he knew that there was a moment where Walter Cronkite would go on TV at night with images around the country of young black men and women being attacked and defenseless to shock the conscience of a nation. That's organizing. A strategic movement towards change. Right? So we break it down for all of them. And then the final piece, individual agency is a transfer of me to we. Collective action has the four components. And the final piece is knowledge. You will succeed sometimes. You will fail a lot more. What can you learn from these that then reinforce what you're doing, but understand that you're never doing anything alone? That you are part of a broader network of people that share your values to do the work that you do. I do have to say, Karen, that this is not a, these aren't like our inventions. These are the work of groups like Narrative 4, uh, work of Mikva Challenge in Chicago, work of organizers for decades who've been doing this. All we are doing in the spirit of supplement, never supplant, understanding our interdependence is mm -hmm. saying, what can we do as the Obama Foundation? We can shine a spotlight, bring people together in ways that others can, mm -hmm. help them see their agency, and then get them to work in their communities. And so that's the, um, the step by step of Yeah, it's fascinating the way we uh, recipe work. for change making. So how do you, do you feel outcome agnostic in terms of the, the agenda or the types of changes um, that people will lead? So you're, you're, you're teaching a process, but not a, um, not a dogma. Not focused on specific mm -hmm. uh, issues. Specific outcomes it, or issues. It is our, if you believe that the fundamental challenge that we have, and I believe this is the case, uh, notwithstanding the intensity and importance of certain issues, is the fact that when, when our interrelationship with each other begins to fray, mm -hmm. the, the, the core of a pluralistic democracy is people mediating differences, compromising when they must, never violating their principles, but finding common ground. Mm -hmm. If you don't do that, if you can't even do that, where essentially it's me against you, us against them, there's one thing that is, is real is the sense of negative partisanship. Mm -hmm. Where if you look at public opinion polling over the course of the past 10 years, more people are saying that they are a partisan Republican or Democrat, not because of what their party stands for, but because of antipathy to the other. When you set that condition, facts die. Mm -hmm. Because it's rare to introduce a fact if the antipathy is so great to the other that you engage in a level of motivated reasoning that says, I'll find and Google whatever fact I need. Right. But even if I'm presented with a complete recipe of why I am wrong, here's the easy default. You may be right, but the other side is worse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And so that, when you think about a mindful approach to leadership, to really train a generation of citizens who understand their responsibilities and understand that the core of democracy isn't just being for this issue, that issue, or that issue. It's deeper. It, how do we work together? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and so that's the, it's not that we're issue agnostic, it's the, the, the intensity is around the essence and the core of right. what keeps the, us the together. The outcomes depend upon that. Yeah. that. An example that you've given, that I've heard you give, is around really teaching people to work together 
around things that are very local. The park on the corner, um, super local issues, rather than start with these kind of national quandaries. And can you talk a little bit about the, the, your thinking there and how that might aid the overall mission? Yeah, so what we say to the young people when we engage with them, um, and they go there pretty quickly, is when we talk about cleaning up a park on the south side of Chicago, where there's been violence, gang violence, and there has been uh, drug trafficking, bringing people in the neighborhood together around that, no one's gonna ask you if you're a Republican or Democrat. Mm -hmm. It is proximate. And the idea that once people in neighborhoods and in communities and cities begin to collaborate together across those labels of D and R and conservative and liberal, it's almost as if you're exercising that muscle of civic engagement. The wonderful things that Tocqueville wrote about 200 years ago about the nation being a nation of associations where if people saw a problem, they would come together to fix it and not wait for anybody else. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a wonderful, and forgive me for this, we convened, uh, Karen, in Johannesburg, South Africa last year. Mm -hmm. One of the Obama Foundation programs is called the Leaders Program. And last year we launched it in Africa. We called it Leaders Africa. And it was the 100th anniversary, it was the 100th birthday of Nelson Mandela. So the Mandela family invited Barack Obama to attend and, and kick it off. We're in, a, we're in a stadium in Joburg with these amazing images of Mandela behind us. And this young South African woman stands up and says, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and privilege to introduce to you Barack Obama. <laughs> President Obama comes onto the stage in Johannesburg. 30,000 people are just going wild. And I'm sitting in the front row and I'm looking at the images of Mandela. And then there's Obama, but what was more impactful were there are 200 young leaders that we had selected out of an application pool of 15,000. And all of them had T-shirts that said, we are the ones. Mm. We are the ones. And it came from a speech that President Obama gave in 2007 that said, change doesn't happen if you wait for one person or if you wait for one time. We are the ones we have been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. You could have shot them out of a cannon. <laughs> And it wasn't because he had conferred hands on them. Mm -hmm. It's because they saw their agency and then they were working in community. Yeah. The 20 from Nigeria, very few of them had met. Two weeks later, we heard they were in Lagos drafting a civic engagement proposal for the Nigerian government. And they got a meeting with the Nigerian leader of the Senate. Why? Because they presented themselves as Obama leaders. It's had the virtue it. of truth. <laughs> I love but, it. But what did we do? All we did was bring them together, say, you have power, here's a network, here's a bunch of tools, get to work. Right? Yeah. And imagine, Karen, if we can do that over the course of the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years in a deliberate and intentional way in every part of the country, blue and red, urban and rural, exurban, suburban, you name it, yeah. all in service of this world that we want to build. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Let's give a... Yeah. The vision is extraordinarily compelling. Before we hop off this stage, uh, I promised that we would come back to your mindfulness practice. So you have had and do have a, an extraordinarily unrelenting <laughs> work life. Um, we've, been, we've been talking a bit about what it was like in the White House. And um, there's, you know, there aren't weekends. Every day is just a day, and whatever's critical that day has to get handled. Time of day doesn't matter. So how in all of this have you been able, very practically, I want to know, not the theoretical answer, how have you been able to manage yeah. a meditation practice? Um, 
One of the things, and, and John Kabat-Zinn was the one, and he didn't realize he was doing it. I was listening to On Being with Krista Tippett. Woo! Uh, <laughs> in 2011, when I was thrust into a job that I had no business doing, uh, overseeing all of the polling and focus group work for the re-election of the President of the United States, I'm not a pollster. Oh, good job, though, by the way. You Thank got you. the job done. <laughs> Uh, so I'm sitting there alone in an apartment in Chicago, and On Being is on, and there's this guy named John Kabat-Zinn talking about mindfulness, and I'm like, hmm, that sounds right. Mm -hmm. And I just started in a very basic, rudimentary way practicing. The way I was able to maintain it during that environment in the White House was when I looked at my schedule during the day, and we would generally get in at 6.30 or 7 o'clock in the morning, and then leave at 8.30 or 9 o'clock at night, Monday through Friday, Saturdays 9 to 5, Sundays a couple hours. The, the walk between meetings. Mindfulness opportunity. Intentionally, mm -hmm. before you go into a meeting and you sit down and you know it's going to be a very difficult meeting, whether it is a 5 or a 10 or a 15 minute second breath, to just get yourself intentionally ready for a very difficult discussion, mm -hmm. was just necessary for me. It became like breathing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I am forever grateful um, uh, to John and to, um, to giving me that gift um, because it was certainly very helpful for me and uh, my, my bride, Shauna, and my two daughters are also very grateful. <laughs> so, I'm but sure. thank you for asking. Great. So. Well, David, thank you for joining me up here and all of us here. And really, thank you for leading such extraordinary work on behalf of the world. Thank you.